for today's video, we'll be looking at one of the more interesting deviations of the pre-Dreadnought era. This was a time of great experimentation the world over, with every navy having some strange ideas and experiments, though how strange certainly varied. From the Germans going for three twin turrets to the very unique French designs. One of the most famous of all the experiments, however, was the American superimposed turret. No, that's not a typo, and I'm not talking about super-firing turrets. On two different classes of battleship, the United States Navy stuck a pair of 8-inch guns on top of the main battery turrets. I've previously covered the first swing at this in USS Kearsarge. Today, we'll be looking at the second attempt with USS Virginia. This was a refinement of the Kearsarge concept in a lot of respects, but it remained just as finicky. Stacking guns like this was difficult to get right, and the Navy never quite managed. Fortunately, Virginia would never be called upon to fight another battleship. This was especially fortunate as the ship and her sisters entered service right around Dreadnought. They were obsolete upon entering the water, basically, though that is hardly unique to these ships. In any case, let's briefly touch on the design before we get into the service that Virginia would actually see. With this being a story that began in the direct aftermath of the Spanish-American War of 1898. That was a conflict where the Navy had done a lot of the heavy lifting. Needless to say, this had an impact back home. Congress was finally willing to shake loose the funding for a proper ocean-going fleet. Larger battleships and cruisers than had previously been authorized. For the battleships, that would result in Virginia, authorized on March 3rd of 1899. However, while the ship was authorized in 1899, it would take some time to begin construction, because the Navy's designers went through several different ideas. For example, a reworking of the main class design. No, not that main. Another battleship laid down in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. Another option put forward was a reworking of the Kearsarge arrangement. One common theme in most of these designs was a desire to use 8-inch guns for the secondary battery. A heavy weapon that was capable of penetrating medium armor on foreign battleships. The Kearsarge layout provided, in theory, the most efficient use of space. In theory. It's worth noting that at the time Virginia was being sketched, Kearsarge had yet to be tested. The ship was in the water, yes. She'd been launched in March 1898 but she wanted commission until early 1900. The Navy was rushing through design so quickly that they weren't giving proper time to test them. Nonetheless, the Virginia design would be approved in February 1901. So let's turn to that design now, starting with displacement. That came out to just under 15,000 tons at the normal loading, with the full load going up to around 16,100 tons. With much of that tonnage coming down to the heavy weaponry, the main battery for its part was pretty traditional. Four 12-inch 305mm guns in two twin turrets, one on either end of the ship. Nothing special there. The secondary battery, though, well, that was the weird part. As noted, this consisted of 8-inch 
203 millimeter guns, specifically eight of them. Four were carried in two wing turrets, one on either broadside. The other eight were carried in special twin mounts fitted to the top of the main battery turrets. Now I'll note that those mounts seem to have worked mostly fine. They didn't have critical flaws or the like. However, that is only on an objective level. In practical use, that wouldn't hold true. By the time Virginia entered service, 12-inch guns had dramatically increased in firing rate, to the point that using the 8-inch guns was more likely to interfere with the main battery. There was very little time between firing the 12-inch guns. Firing the secondary guns was more likely to create smoke and concussion that messed with the main battery. The Navy would try various combinations of firing rates, but none of them quite worked, making the entire experiment something of a failure in the end. That aside, the remainder of the weaponry was rather more traditional if admittedly still quite heavy, consisting of no fewer than 12 6-inch 152mm guns in single casement mountings, along with another 12 3-inch 76mm guns for anti-torpedo boat use, backed up by, you probably guessed it, another 12 3-pounder guns and the traditional four submerged torpedo tubes to round it all off. Virginia, if nothing else, fairly bristled with weaponry. What about the armor, though? Well, this was far more typical pre-dreadnought, a main belt that ranged from 8 to 11 inches, 203 millimeters to 279 millimeters in thickness. Lighter armor protected the casements, bow, and stern, while the deck armor came out to three inches at its thickest. And that brings us to speed to wrap this up. With this coming out to 19 knots on 19,000 indicated horsepower, through two shafts, a relatively fast speed for a pre-dreadnought. That said, it does wrap off the design section. A bit long, I'll admit, but I wanted to cover the background here. And the service history will be, let's just call it, typical pre-dreadnought fare. And how quiet it was, for the most part. With that story beginning on May 21st, 1902, in the Newport News Shipbuilding Yard. The ship that became Virginia was laid down, with her construction taking about four years all told. She was launched on April 6, 1904, and commissioned on May 7, 1906, almost exactly four years after the keel was laid. However, by this point, Dreadnought was in the water and soon to enter service. Quite ignoring the issues with the superimposed turrets, Virginia was already obsolescent because of this. As were all other pre-dreadnoughts the world over. Even so, the Navy would still get their use out of her. Virginia began her shakedown cruise shortly after commissioning, with this running through most of 1906. Most. On September 15th of 1906, Virginia would be dispatched to Cuba. A revolt had broken out against the government, and the United States intervened. Virginia was one of the ships sent in to keep an eye on things, arriving in Havana Harbor on the 21st of September. She would remain there until October 13th, when things had cooled down enough for Virginia to return home. By this point, the sea trials were considered done, so the battleship went in for the traditional post-trial overhaul. 
that would see her in Norfolk from November 3rd, 1906 to February 18th, 1907. Though the fitting of new fire control equipment would keep her in dock until the end of March 1907, at which point it was back to Cuba, not to keep an eye on revolutionaries, but to train with the rest of the fleet. That particular training only lasted into early April. That said, the rest of 1907 would also be spent on training work, along with some time in dock here and there to tweak the ship or fix general wear and tear, along with the fitting of early radio equipment, making her one of the first ships to receive this. Still, it was, for the most part, a quiet year. Until the very end. If you study the United States Navy, you know what began at the end of 1907. President Roosevelt's Great Showing the Flag Expedition. Better known, of course, as the Great White Fleet. Virginia would go through one final refit at Hampton Roads on December 6th through December 16th, at which point the ship, painted predominantly white as the name implies, sets sail, along with much of the ocean-going United States Navy. The Great White Fleet proved to be a resounding success, and so far as showing off the Navy went. The ships involved were largely obsolescent, but in 1907, well, they remained an imposing force with Virginia in particular sailing all over the world, from Turkey to the Philippines, China, and Japan. There weren't any notable issues for the ship in the world cruise that ran from December 1907 through February 1909. In any event, once back home, Virginia returned to her training work. She would continue practicing in the Atlantic through much of 1909, with a brief detour for a European cruise in December, with this involving visits to France and Britain. Outside that visit, not much would happen of note for quite some time, really. Virginia would spend 1909 through 1913 on training duty. The most excitement came not from random voyages or the like, but from the odd experiment. Such as, for example, trying coaling at sea from the Collier Vestal in May 1910, an early preview of the future underway replenishment that the United States Navy would become so well known for. Also, yes, I'm referring to that USS Vestal. She had a better time with Virginia than she would with Arizona. At any rate, not much would happen until 1913. In that year, Virginia was once more assigned to watch a Latin American revolution. Although this time, it was in Mexico with the ship anchored off Tampico on February 15, 1913. She would remain there through late March, aside from a brief detour to Veracruz for coal. While the ship would leave Mexico in March 1913, it wouldn't be for long. She spent summer and autumn on training duty. But by November, the ship was back in Mexican waters, where she would remain until January 1914. At which point, another short Training and refit stent followed from February through April of 1914. However, with conditions in Mexico continuing to deteriorate, Virginia would be back at Veracruz by April of that year, supporting the American occupation into October 1914. Those stents off Mexico, as it turned out, would be the closest Virginia ever came to actual combat duty. While war in Europe broke out in 
in late July 1914, Virginia wouldn't be involved. She spent her time during the Great War either in Mexican waters or on more training duty, with the exception of a large overhaul from March 1916 through April 1917, something intended to keep the ship capable of at least second-line duty. In any case, she was still in port on April 6, 1917, when the United States declared war on Germany. Because of this, her crew was available to act as impromptu marines. Virginia's men would see several German ships that had previously been interned in the United States, including a rather famous one in the form of America. Now, don't get me wrong, that was important work, but their own ship was kept on second-line duty. Virginia would finish her refit at the end of August 1917, at which point she was put to use on more training work to try and get the Navy's gunnery to where it needed to be. This was an important job, though not a glamorous one. The same could be said for her convoy escort work in late 1918, starting on October 14th. The battleship escorted a convoy halfway to France before turning home to prepare for a second run. This was pretty similar to how old British battleships would be used in the Second World War. However, unlike the Revenges 20 years later, Virginia only escorted one convoy. She was supposed to set sail again on November 12th, but the war ended on November 11th of 1918, leaving Virginia to sail for France to bring American soldiers home. Ultimately, she would carry some 6,000 men back from France, with the aging battleship decommissioned soon after on August 13th 1920. Virginia would likely have been scrapped at this point. Except instead, she was taken in hand for use as a bombing target in August of 1923. That would see a group of army bombers attack the ship with 1,100 pound bombs. Only two hit directly, though these devastated the stern and the upper works. Further near misses punched in plates beneath the surface, the combination of which saw the ship sink within 30 minutes on September 5th, 1923. The ship that began as an experiment ended as an experiment. That's fitting, I suppose. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.